Dow the Assassin, also known as the Knife of Dunwall, a regicidal sellsword and leader of the infamous gang of supernatural killers known as the Whalers. He's the suave asexual hunk that murdered the most powerful woman in all of the Isles. He's one of the most important and influential figures in the entire Dishonored franchise, and while he may have started off as little more than a mysterious antagonist for our favourite son to hunt down, throughout the series' lifespan, he came to be an incredibly fleshed out and iconic character. Ego Homini Lupus I am a wolf to man. These are the words by which our arcane assassin lives and dies. Based on this, as well as his actions during the course of the first Dishonored game, you'd be well within your right to assume Dao to be an inherently evil individual. But throughout the course of the DLC campaign sharing his own moniker, the Knife of Dunwall, as well as its follow-up, the Brigmore Witches, it comes to light that things may not be as black and white as they initially seem. While Dowd isn't quite the shining beacon of justice and morality like his friend Corvo, he's by no means a bad guy. If anything, he's a deeply troubled individual, with an extremely bleak past. In fact, Dowd's upbringing is so horrifically depressing that it's frankly shocking how well adjusted this man actually is. And I know what it felt like to shove a blade into your empress. Born in Sokonos on the 13th day of the month of ice, 1795, his origins trace back to an island off the mysterious Pandisian continent, where his mother was rumoured to have hailed from. Dowd was conceived aboard a pirate vessel while his mother was being held captive. During her time aboard, whispers of her being a witch marked by the outsider circulated. Dowd acknowledged her proficiency in poisons and hallucinogens, as well as her ruthlessness in wielding them but adamantly denies the idea, which is explained in his autobiographical writings found at the start of the Brigmore Witches, which reads, They say my mother was a witch, but the truth, as is so often the case, depends on perspective and your place in the world. She relied on poisons made from exotic herbs and the blowfish that live in the reef waters near Pandisia. Her power originated in hallucinogens delivered through guile, or by force to those who crossed her. There was an unusual intensity in her gaze for certain, but it came from within, not from the outsider. On an unassuming day during Dowd's youth, he was playing in the street with some of the other children, when a passing stranger noticed the boy's natural display of speed and skill. The man decided to abduct the young boy for his own nefarious purposes, and the happy boy who'd been carelessly frolicking with his peers only moments before was never seen again after this fateful event, quickly twisting and contorting him into the figure we know today. The details of the years following the abduction aren't known, but at 16, Dowd set off on his own journey and eventually settled in Dunwall, where he quickly made a name for himself as a sellsword and in a reputation as a formidable foe and extremely skilled fighter. Despite this though, Dowd wanted more. His quest for knowledge and power sent him down a path that would eventually lead him to seek out the outsider himself. Rumours suggest that he spent a winter at the Academy of Natural Philosophy in order to better understand the black-eyed bastard. Eventually in 1820, the outsider finally marked him, forever changing the course of his life. Now branded with the outsider's mark and gifted with the incredible supernatural abilities that come with it, Dowd became an infamous assassin for hire, feared not just for his skill, but also for his mastery of the mysterious arts. His gang the Whalers, which was formed shortly thereafter, quickly grew in size and power, with Dowd actively recruiting members from all walks of life. For years I had held together a shadowy band of ex-mercenaries, street kids and refugees through discipline and a bit of black magic. Some of these members could feed off of his newly acquired powers through an arcane bond, which Dowd writes about in his personal journal, saying, Every one of my whalers is good, though my gifts seem stronger in some than in others. The outsider's mark is a mystery in this way, not something I can control. Those who remain with me either gain in use of my extraordinary abilities, or they don't. In 1829, while prowling the rooftops of Dunwall, Dowd inadvertently saved the life of a young street urchin, who then followed and convinced him to take them on as his apprentice. This street urchin was named Billy Lurk, 
and would go on to become the Whaler's second in command. When I first caught sight of Dowd, I was just a broken kid, staying alive out of spite. He cut the throats of three men without making a sound, leaving only blood and death in his wake. I don't know what I was hoping for when I followed him that night, but he shared his strange magic with me. And more than that, his skill, his time, his trust, and sometimes his secrets. In the midst of a plague-stricken Dunwall, Dowd's life took a pivotal turn when he accepted a contract to assassinate Empress Jessamine Coldwyn and kidnap her daughter Emily. This event would go on to have a resounding effect on his life going forward. Haunted by the assassination, Dowd began to feel remorse and regret. He'd looked into Jessamine Coldwyn's eyes at the moment her life slipped away, and in that moment, a thought occurred to him. He'd made a mistake. He'd been misled. That kind of thinking was useless. She was just as dead, whether he regretted it or not, but he'd seen his true face reflected in her eyes. Seen himself for what he really was. Not a renowned assassin, not some great shaper of history, just another playing piece in an unknowable game. I'm here because you're right. The Empress was different. There will be consequences. Your story is close to ending, and even you can't escape it. I'm here to give you one last gift, Dowd. It's a mystery. One that starts with a name. Delilah. His encounter with his old friend the Outsider started Dowd on a quest to find the meaning behind this mysterious message. After six long months of searching, a lead finally came up when he learned of a ship by that same name, in the possession of a whale slaughterhouse owner named Bundry Rothwild, so Dowd sets off to ask him a few questions. Before arriving at the slaughterhouse, Dowd meets his apprentice Billy overlooking the shipyard, where she fills him in on some of the specifics of the mission at hand. There's a strike at the plant, and it's no wonder. Rothwild runs this place like a prison. The stupid workers can't even get in without a time card. When the strike started, the butchers confiscated all the cards they could find. They've given the city watch free reign to use force. If you ever wondered why I wanted out of the slums, here's your answer. Dowd sneaks past the guards in the street, going through the abandoned buildings and over the rooftops, progressing towards the factory, until he's once again greeted by Billy. There's a man out on the river watching the place. If I weren't so young and pure of heart, I'd suggest he's up to no good. Dowd finds a boiling pot ceremoniously presented, as well as a note, or rather, a riddle, hinting at a list of ingredients for the pot. They used to tell stories about a woman in the slums who did work like this. Granny Rags. They said she was a hundred years old. Though he pays little mind and carries on with the mission, Dowd sneaks into the slaughterhouse undetected, avoiding the gaze of guards and butchers alike, not going out of his way to save any of the workers, nor to play into Granny Rag's sinister plans. With a singular focus, he stays steadfast on finding Rothwild and questioning him about the ship named Delilah. He uses the dockside winch to enter the building and then sneaks through the rafters before reaching a live whale strung up in the air. The power system in there looks like it will put down that whale in an instant. I almost think you should. I know they're just beasts, but still. Dowd proceeds to stealthily make his way through the rest of the slaughterhouse as he goes towards Rothwell's office. After interrupting an ongoing interrogation, his reputation precedes him, and the woman who he rescued has a proposition for him. Well, Dowd, I need something from you. That's what I thought. What? What? Destroy this entire place. Boom. What about the people inside? Growing a conscience? The factory workers, they can die screaming for all I care. Don't try and con me. Wouldn't dream of it. You take care of the slaughterhouse and I'll tell you everything I know about the Delilah. 
Taking the woman's offer into consideration, Dal decides that killing every single person in the building the might be a tad extreme and carries Rothwald's unconscious body down into the interrogation room. Dowd, I spotted a makeshift interrogation room in the meat locker. It might be useful to you, considering our mission here. I'll make sure you get to enjoy this. What do you want to know that's worth crossing a man like me? I want to know about a ship named Delilah. What's behind the name? Joke on your own spit. Who is Delilah? Ha! Think I'll give up a friend at the first tickle? That's the kind of thing I'd pay your sister for down at the Golden Cat. We'll feed you through your own factory. See if we can get oil out of your blubber. You know your work, I'll give you that. Who was the previous owner? Barrister Timps, all right? After subjecting the factory owner to some light shock therapy, he learns what he can about Delilah, both the ship and its namesake, as well as the next lead to follow on this journey going forward, a nobleman named Timsh. Now that Dowd has gotten all the information that he can out of Rothwald, he knocks him back out and carries his limp body across the blood covered floors towards the exit, stopping along the way to see to it that Rothwald is put inside a shipping crate bound for the icy Tivian wastes. As he makes his way out of the area, he assists Billy in handling the situation caused by a group of overseers, and the two of them leave to pursue their next lead. Barrister Timsh lives up in the legal district. I know it pretty well. From what I hear, the Timsh family is practically at war with itself. Talk to his niece Tali if you can. Emerging from the sewers, we see Billy subduing a guard that blocked your path, before explaining Talia should be waiting in Trevor's close. It's an alley just past the Wall of Light. You'll know it by three whitewashed skulls. Your apprentice then leaves to go and scout ahead. Dowd sneaks past any potential resistance, quickly and quietly avoiding the checkpoint ahead. After arriving at the alleyway with three white skulls, Dowd sees Talia being harassed by a member of the Hatter's gang. Upon engaging the lone gang member, two others reveal themselves, springing from the roof above. Dowd makes short work of them and meets up with his informant. The Master Assassin. So you want to know about Delilah? Well, my uncle is bewitched by her, so we won't tell you anything. Bring me his last will and testament. In exchange, I'll tell you what you want to know about Delilah Copperspoon. And I'll pay you cold hard coin for your trouble. Come back to me when it's done. Let's meet at the docks when you return. He continues into the abandoned house and discovers the Hatter's hideout. While inside, he comes across a key which will give him access to the legal district. Clearing out the couple of guards that are blocking the door, Dowd makes his way through, where he's met by Billy. She informs him that his assassins have been scouting the area for some time, and that there's a stash of supplies stored on a rooftop nearby, which just happens to be the perfect vantage point to... Though Dowd most likely didn't do that. It's more likely that while exploring the legal district, he happens upon a strange man wearing a mask, who tells him of Timch's wicked ways and points him in the direction of an abandoned apartment. You wouldn't be in, in the apartment, he finds an eviction notice, which Dowd can use to help deal with Barrister Timch. Just a couple doors down is the apartment, where there's a putrid bag of plague victim remains, as well as an outsider shrine. He sneaks into Timch's house and swaps the immunity papers with the eviction notice. He then fills the vents with the bag of plague victim viscera. Let's go out back and wait for it to clear up. 
Once the foul smell has made its way through and out of the house, the city guards turn up and confront the barrister about the putrid stench. Ah, Timps, it smells like a weeper den. I thought we were secure. And we are. The neighborhood is swept three times a week. Barrister Timps! Please, call me Arnold. We're friends. Here. This will clear things up for you. He goes to show his documents, but instead hands over the eviction notice that Dowd had previously what is planted. This? Is this a joke? I am not sure what you find funny about it. Barrister Timsh, this is a letter from the Lord Regent dated a month ago, stating that your building is to be seized by the state immediately due to massive infection outbreak. This is impossible! I, I, Barrister, I am afraid I am going to have to take you into custody. And if I or any of my men contract the plague because of this visit, I'll see that your head rolls. No, no, no! This isn't the right document! This... Get him out of here before he starts bleeding from the eyes. And secure this court! It's under quarantine. Yes, sir. You fainted. Now what? I don't want to touch him. What if I get sick? I'll just... Wait for him to wake up. Don't look at me. I don't get paid enough for this. I saw Talia. She's waiting where she said she'd be. With the mission complete, Dad returns to the docks, where he informs Talia. The barrister's enemies caught up to him. He's in custody as a plague victim. Here's the will as agreed. That'll do nicely. But you were promised information. Well, my uncle came under Delilah's spell. He was obsessed with her. My uncle became infatuated. But he looked older and made us keep candles lit all night. He was afraid of the dark. One night we all went to Waverly Boyles for a seance. I thought only the dead appeared at seances. But suddenly Delilah was in the room with us. She was there, but not there. We saw her as if she was very far away, standing in the old Brigmore Manor, painting at an easel, painting a name. It was your name, Dal. That's all I know. I hope you find what you're looking for. Then heads back home to rest at the hideout. Let's go home. Upon returning home, he is informed that while he was away, their base was attacked by a group of overseers. Doubt we've been attacked. Overseers are tearing the place and apart. And some of his assassins had been captured. They're holding our remaining men and their leader is in your chambers as we speak. I want to know how the bastards found us in the first place. Doubt scouts the area, finding the assault plan, freeing the few captured assassins, and killing any overseer he comes across as revenge for his fallen whalers. Once all of the assassins have been freed, Dowd gives the order to capture any remaining overseers and regroup once complete. Capture as many as you can. Their plans are ruined. Give me a report. It seems the overseers are marching into the flooded district, planning a massive assault against us. This overseer, Hume, went against orders and attacked early. How did the cursed overseers find us? It's my fault. I told Delilah where we were hidden. She wanted me to turn on you. You did this. But I can't go through with it. Stupid child. All you had to do was cut his throat. He deserves better. I was an idiot to listen to you. So that's your choice, then. Dowd. Her betrayal would have been the sweetest. But either way, the Brigmore Witches will be your end. You should have forgotten my name the day you heard it. My life is yours now. Kill me, or let me live. If it even matters to you. Touching and pathetic. If I see either of you again, I'll tear out your stone-cold hearts and walk in your skin. I forgive you. Get out of here. Leave the city. Leave my sight, Billy. I give you your life. Some time passes as Dowd and his men recover from the overseer's attack 
Though the looming threat of his enemies, both new and old, weigh heavy on his mind, haunting his dreams and consuming his thoughts. He awakes to the startling sight of his assassin's unsettling stare. Once adjusted, Dow quickly gets back to his pursuit of the mysterious figure known as Delilah. Thomas has returned with the information you requested. He's waiting for you below. While preparing for the upcoming mission, Thomas informs him of Lizzie Stride, who can assist them and get into the Brickmore Manor. Though she's currently locked up in Coldridge Prison. Coldridge, we can use this. We'll get her out, and Stride will have to pay back the favor. We'll have our transport. Delilah doesn't leave Brigmore Manor anymore, which means I have to come to her. The manor's upriver, far out past the quarantine line. But what I need is a smuggler who knows the river, someone I can trust. The best choice I have is Lizzie Stride, and Lizzie Stride is in jail. With this information, Dowd retrieves his things and makes his way to break out Lizzie. I'll be back with Lizzie Stride. Stay hidden. They don't hesitate to kill their own. Why did you save me? I'm looking for Elizabeth Stride, the eel woman. She's a piece of work, isn't she? You can check the logbook in the guard station between sections C and D. Lizzie Stride. She's in rough shape. Wake up, Lizzie. Whoever sent you, I'll pay double. I've come to break you out. You can owe me the favor. What kind of favor? Does it matter? What kind? It's just a boat trip. Then you're out of luck. My boat, the Undine, now belongs to someone else. My second in command double crossed me into a little shit named Edgar Wakefield. It's a situation I'm familiar with. Can you walk? Get me out of this damn thing and I'll fly. I think I... Oh. I'll have to carry her out. She's beaten, but not dead. See that her wounds get attention. It will be done. All quiet, sir. Ready to go. Let's go. Lizzie informs Dad that she's happy to lend her ship with the one problem being that is currently under the control of that traitorous bastard Edgar. A little shit. Deep in the bounds of the old shopping district, which just happens to pass through the exact location of an ongoing turf war between her gang, the Dead Eels, and the Mad Hatters. Upon arriving in the district, Dowd immediately has to avoid the gaze of the warring gangs, using the alcoves and fixtures of the once grand shopping district to do so progressing across the river and towards the waterfront, where Lizzie's boat is being held by Edgar. Thomas remarks that he thinks she'll be in watched, before suggesting a potential entryway to the ship. Smuggling ships like this one often have a hatch underneath for dumping contraband if they get caught. Perhaps the Undine is no different. Using this, Dowd comes out of the water right in front of Edgar, where he sticks him with a sleeping dart in order to allow Lizzie to deal with him later. With this done, Dowd rings the bell and signals her to return to the ship. Lizzie Stride is assuming control of the Dead Eels now. She's ordered them to give you safe passage. Lizzie then reveals to Dowd that in order for the boat to run, they'll need to acquire an engine coil. That piece of garbage, Edgar. He let the Hatters cripple the Undine. They took the engine coil. We're dead in the water. We'll have to get it back. The geezer still leads the Hatter gang, right? I'll pay him a visit. The geezer's about a hundred years old by now. He's got it rigged so that if he dies, the whole place gets gassed. Maybe you can cut a deal for that engine coil. Turn on a charm. She gives him the password Whalebone. to gain entries so he can try to negotiate with him. 
Dowd is warned that the Hatter's hideout has a deadly gas trap, and if their leader falls, everyone inside will too. What's the password? Whalebone. Come in, Hatter. Sir, the Hatters are using the textile machines to make shrouds for the plague dead. Now we know why they took the engine coil. The man who runs the Hatters is more cunning than he looks. You may have to make a deal. Despite the danger, he negotiates with them. I'm looking for Lizzie's drive missing engine coil. I'm giving you a chance to make a deal. It's a great job. Geezer here says you're in love. We only need that engine coil because someone shut off the flow that turns our water wheel. When the water flows, I'll give you the engine coil. Here's the key to the sewer entrance. And it's a pleasure to do business with you, Mr. Dow. Offering to fix their sewer water flow in exchange for the engine coil. Dow battles witches in the sewers as he heads deeper. Hello? You're not a weaver, are you? I think I can walk if you'll just help me up. Freeze the machinery, ensure improper water flow, and reclaim the coil from the hatters. It's done, but I don't think you'll see your men again. User <laughs> says a deal's a deal. The code is three, eight, seven. If this gets me closer to Delilah's throat. So be it. With the engine coil in hand, Dowd prepares for the next phase of his mission, returning to the ship and sailing upriver towards the Brigmore Manor. Please, do the honors, Dowd. Fire up the engine from the bridge. The Brigmores were an ancient family, bankrupted a generation ago. Since then, the manor has housed innumerable rats and the Brigmore witches. I'd always left them alone, but... Now a painter named Delilah had taken up witchcraft and formed a coven. She was trying something. The outsider knows. I cannot abide a mystery. Upon arriving on the Brigborn Manor shore, Thomas informs Dowd that on his scouting mission, he spotted several snares and suspicious statues of Delilah. But I spotted several statues of the woman Delilah. I don't know what it means. But I thought it was worth mentioning. It means trouble. They're getting in and out of the house somehow. But I haven't spotted it. Sorry, sir. Best I can do. Good enough. I'll take it from here. Dowd thanks Thomas for the information and begins to investigate the surrounding area. Using his blink ability, he bypasses a fence and discovers a grave house. Inside, he finds a note that guides him to a lever in the garden shed. He then returns to the grave house and repairs the switch. Pulling down on the lever uncovers an entrance to the Brigmore crypts. Filled with rats and traps. He maneuvers his way through until he reaches a set of stairs that leads into the manor. He makes his way inside, climbing up into the ceiling to avoid the watchful eye of the witches within. Once it's clear, Dad continues to explore the manor, where he comes across an overseer who's in the process of denouncing his vows. No, don't. What happened to you? I denounce. I denounce the oracles. Oracles. They. They saw. The Caldwin girl is the key. The girl in the painting. Where's Delilah? A witch then appears and silences the overseer. Down the hall, Dowd finds a note which details where and how Delilah can be found. The note reads, I've ordered the lantern to be placed in my studio in the West Wing. Use it to enter the painting. Dad continues to explore the manor, 
before happening upon the lantern. With his newfound knowledge and the lantern in hand, he makes his way towards the gallery through the flooded halls, avoiding the many witches patrolling the hallway. Approaching the painting, he sees that it's being guarded by two of the witches. He quietly takes them out He sets the lantern down near the painting, allowing him to enter the painted void where he's met by the outsider. You have many talents, Dowd, and they've served you. Delilah's talents are quite different. I gave you Delilah's name, and you followed it to this moment. You see now what hangs in a balance. Emily's life, Delilah's ambition, an empire in the act of crumbling. I give my mark sparingly, and I don't play favorites, but I will watch this with unusual attention. The Void. Time to see what you've really got, Delilah. Dowd sneaks his way up to Delilah's ritual site, where he sees the witch along with a painting of young lady Emily. He avoids gaining her attention in order to retrieve a second painting conveniently stored nearby. Are all artists narcissists? Would any painting work for Delilah's ritual? I wonder, this painting might be useful. Brush touches paint. Brush touches canvas. He chooses to spare her life, trapping her inside the painting. Brush touches void. And now I see you, Emily Caldwell. You've lived in these bones long enough, sweet young girl. With this action, Dowd has gained peace of mind knowing his mysterious adversary is locked away indefinitely, leaving the painted void to return home. No one will ever know exactly what it took to save Emily Caldwin from a living death as Delilah's puppet. No one except the outsider. I've learned that our choices always matter. To someone. Somewhere. And sooner or later, in ways we can't always fathom, the consequences come back to us. I came from Circonos to Dunwall as a boy, made my living as a killer, one of the few who've heard the outsider's voice. I murdered an empress, but saved her daughter, who will one day rule the empire. Those were my choices. I'm ready for what comes. As Dao's actions continued to reverberate through the aisles, he eventually found himself at odds with Corvo Atano once again, this time in the flooded district. In a final confrontation, he pleaded for his life. I asked for my life. When I killed your empress and took her daughter, something broke inside me. Now I want nothing but to leave this city and fade from the memory of those who reside here. I've had enough killing. 
acknowledging the weight of his choices and the consequences they brought. So my life is in your hands. Make your choice. You make an eloquent plea for a man with innocent blood on his hands. It's a shame Corvo doesn't know the real story, isn't it? How in these last days you passed through Coldridge Prison like a shadow, dared the tangles of Dunwall's underworld, and walked out unscathed, outwitted one of the greatest witches in a generation, all with consummate care and skill. How you saved Emily Caldwin, daughter of the Empress, first of her name, and no one will ever know. But how does it end for Dowd, the hired killer, the murderer, the savior of the Empire? It's up to Corvo now. He paid his respects to Empress Jessamine's grave and left Dunwall behind, retiring to Karnaka. On the streets of Karnaka, I met you long ago. When the city was so peaceful and the fate seemed to grow. And so, the tale of Dowd, the knife of Dunwall, assassin and reaper, came to a close. But his legacy remained forever etched in the annals of the Isles. A story of choices and consequences, of remorse and redemption. That's the end, mate. Piss off.